Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If I can have your attention for a second, please. If you all could uh, please find your seats and get settled in. The sooner you'll be able to start eating and the sooner you can hear from our speakers. Uh, I'd now like to introduce the Chancellor of the University of Arkansas, Dr. Joseph Steinmetz. Thank you, Mervyn. Good morning, good morning, and welcome, everyone. I, I always get this duty of trying to call everybody to order here and to get some people to sit down and we can, we can begin. So on behalf of the University of Arkansas, I want to welcome everyone to this 25th annual Business Forecast Luncheon. Thanks for coming and thanks for supporting this event. As always, you can expect a very informative and a very insightful conversation uh, this afternoon. And hopefully, this is, the, this is the fourth year that I've been at this uh, uh, luncheon, and I always hope that the forecasters can help us make some sense out of what's going on, which is a, a pretty tumultuous national and international business environment right now. Um, I want to recognize and thank, of course, Mervyn Jabaraj and his colleagues at the Center for Business and Economic Research, which is part of our Sam M. Walton College of Business. Thank them for coordinating this event. They'll also be releasing the university's latest economic impact study later this month, so watch for it. And this study is important because it helps clarify the university's role in economic development and it also demonstrates how investments in the university are repaid several fold in economic activity in the region and in the state. The Center for Business and Economic Research also produces the annual State of the Northwest Arkansas Region Report, a compact but very comprehensive snapshot of how our region is doing in relations to other regions and other areas. This work is just part of the Walton College of Business's larger effort, which reflects the university's commitment to outreach, outreach that serves and advances the economic interests of our state. I should add that the university was also a recent recipient of a $23.7 million grant from the Walton Family Charitable Support Foundation for Research and Economic Development. This grant will support and strengthen the university's research engine, first of all, and drive innovation across multiple dis disciplines, lead to commercialization of new technologies, and ultimately advance economic activity in the state. It's a really big deal, and we're ex extremely excited about this grant and what it means for the university and for the state. And further, we appreciate the confidence it shows in the university's capacity to be a great driver of innovation and economic growth. We, we certainly intend to show what we can do. Let me wrap up by thanking all of today's sponsors. We couldn't be doing this without you. I also want to thank our speakers joining Mervyn today. That's Steve Gibbs, Carolyn Evans, and Ross Duvall. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Have a great lunch, and let's hope for some encouraging news. I'd now like to invite the dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business, Matt Waller, up to say a few words. Uh, help me thank him for his continuing leadership. Good morning. I am Matt Waller, Dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business here at the University of Arkansas. Before we get going, a couple of updates I'd like to give you is uh, the Walton College has opened a new executive education facility in Little Rock. How many of you are aware of that, just out of curiosity? A few? Um, so this, this executive education center in Little Rock is right across the street, it's on Main Street and 2nd, right across from uh, the Capitol Hotel parking lot. And, uh, you know, the Walton College has been providing an executive education for Northwest Arkansas in addition to undergraduate education and graduate education, of course, since 1926. Um, but uh, but this executive education uh, program, the executive ed education programs we have are uh, very effective and successful, and we decided to extend them to Little Rock. 
And our facility in Little Rock uh, is already very busy. We've got about 20 in open enrollment uh, programs uh, that are available this semester. These are non-credit uh, professional development programs. It includes things like leadership, continuous improvement, marketing, these kinds of things. But if you know of anyone that's interested, uh, please uh, look at our website or contact me. We'd love to have you involved. One other thing I'd like to uh, point out is we have a program, um, you know, the Walton College now is up to about 6,500 students. We're one of the largest uh, business schools in the region, but we're also very well ranked. We've been in the top 30 for quite some time. And uh, but we have a program called the Executive MBA. And many of you, the reason I'm bringing it up is many of you are qualified for it. We, that program is for people that have an undergraduate degree. It doesn't matter what area it's in, but they have significant work experience. And it really is a fantastic program, so we would love to have you involved in that. Okay, we would like to thank Marianne Greenwood for her assistance in securing this year's speakers and for her unwavering support of this program and the Walton College. Marianne is a good friend of the University of Arkansas and the entire Arkansas business community. Let's give Marianne a hand. I would particularly like to recognize the 2018 Business Forecast Luncheon sponsors. Uh, this program wouldn't be possible without the generosity of so many corporations and individuals. The proceeds of this event go to support the outreach efforts of the Walton College's Center for Business and Economic Research. All sponsor tables have company logos on their table signs. Now, here's a request. Would representatives of each of these sponsors stand as I call your name? Please remain standing and hold your applause until the, all the sponsors have been recognized. The Walton presenting partner is Walmart Sam's Club. We appreciate their longtime support and generosity for this program. The Walton academic partners are Greenwood Gerhardt Inc., RMP LLP Attorneys at Law, and Tyson Foods. So representatives of those companies need to stand and remain stand, not quite finished. Our corporate, Walton corporate partners are JP Morgan Chase, Cox Communications, Kutak Rock, McGriff Insurance Services, Simmons Foods, Smithhurst PLC, and Wizinvest Realty LLC. Walton business partners are represented by AEP, Southwestern Electric Power Company, Black Hills Energy, Colliers International, Connor and Winters, Attorneys at Law and Counselors at Law, Frost P. LLC, J.B. Hunt Transport Services, Inc., Hogan Taylor LLP, Iberia Bank, Landmark, Certified Public Accountants, McKee Foods, Mitchell Williams, Quattlebaum, Grooms and Toll, PLLC, Regions Bank, Cushman and Wakefield, Sage Partners, and Wright, Lindsay and Jennings, LLP. We appreciate our Walton Media Partners, Arkansas Money and Politics, Celebrate Arkansas, and Talk Business and Politics, Northwest Arkansas Business Journals. Let's give a round of applause for all the sponsors for making this event successful for 25 years. Some of our sponsors have also made it possible for over 40 of our Walton College students to join us and attend the luncheon today. Students, please stand. Students of the Walton College, please stand. I know there's some over here at least. Should be at least 40. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Um, today's event is hosted by the Walton College's Center for Business and Economic Research and is offered in conjunction with the National Association for Business Economics. We'd like to welcome Tom Beers, Executive Director of the National Association for Business Economics, who is attending today. And we have Congressman Steve Womack, our representative in DC, is here with us today. Welcome, Congressman.
We also want to welcome the staff from the Office of Governor Asa Hutchinson, the Office of the State Attorney General, and the many mayors, city council members, and county judges from communities throughout the state. I would also like to welcome members of the Chancellor's Executive Committee, deans, and Walton College and University of Arkansas fac faculty and staff here today. Would all University of Arkansas faculty and staff please stand? Faculty and staff. One final thing I'll say is that um, this is the 20th anniversary of the gift that made our College of Business, the Sam and Walton College of Business, that completely transformed us into a top 30 public business school in the United States. Um, it was a phenomenal gift and we're very grateful for it. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mervyn Jebaraj, Director of the Center for Business and Economic Research. Mervyn is going to announce who among you were the most accurate economic forecasters in 2018. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, last year, Michael Milken referred to this event, this is the 25th annual Arkansas Business Forecast Luncheon, as the Davos of the heartland. Uh, if that's true, that makes you all members of the global elite, or at least the heartland elite. So it is time for you to go on and brush those shoulders off, you know, get that dirt off your shoulder. And uh, we will move on to uh, the awards for the forecast contest winners from last year. So each year, there's a blue form at your table. You'll find it among all those papers that you see there. It has 15 economic indicators that you can forecast for the year ahead. So today's winners are the folks that predicted uh, the most accurate uh, economic indicators in 2018. And so we have uh, four award winners here with us today. And I'll start first with the Dow Jones Industrial Average Forecaster. Um, we have a separate award for this category. And last year, our contestants uh, that's all of you in here, produced a consensus forecast that the Dow would grow by about 7% uh, and end the year at 26,400. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Dow Jones where it is today. Um, so undoubtedly, your forecasts were really optimistic. Um, I think uh, you, you were buoyed by how the stock market did in 2017. Uh, but unfortunately for all of your predictions and your retirement accounts at the end of 2018, between the trade concerns, the shutdown, uh, the stock market uh, had a spectacular decline. In fact, you could uh, say it probably absolutely hit a wall at the end of the year. Um, so, uh, in a sense, our winner for the Dow Jones Industrial Forecast was uh, actually our most pessimistic forecaster. Uh, he predicted that the Dow would drop to 23,216 and was only off by a little bit. Uh, Todd Parker from Cox Communications, as you come up to this stage, congratulations on being the Dow Jones Industrial Forecast winner. Now, before I turn to the overall forecasting awards, as we do each year, I want to take a moment to recognize a special friend of Business Forecast, uh, Dan Grubb, who passed away a few years ago, was among the people that uh, helped start this wonderful program 25 years ago. He was a steadfast supporter of the college, this program, and would always make sure to turn in his contest form. He also won this award one time. So can I please get an, uh, an applause in memory of Dan B. Grubb? I'll now announce the three best overall forecasters from last year. Our third place forecast winner is Natalie Bartholomew of Grand Savings Bank. 
You probably know her as the Girl Banker, a platform that she uses to advocate for women in banking. Natalie? Our second place forecaster is Rick Moody from Chambers Bank. Rick, congratulations. And the top spot, the Dan Bree Grubb Award for Best Economic Forecast goes to Cindy Ballou from the Sunshine School and Development Center. In a few years, the kids from Northwest Arkansas are going to be great economic forecasters with fo folks like Cindy around. So please help me congratulate all of our contest winners. And please make sure to fill in your own contest form and turn it in at the end of the program. Dean? You'll find the form for next year's contest on your table, so be sure to get your computer out, pull up your spreadsheet, and make a forecast. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. Steve Gibbs is Senior Vice President, Chief Accounting Officer, and Controller for Tyson Foods. Steve is responsible for leading, coordinating, and directing, directing corporate finance and accounting to provide complete, accurate, timely, and actionable financial information to the company. Most recently, Steve served as Vice President and Chief Accounting Officer for Keurig Green Mountain Inc., a publicly traded consumer products and durables company and maker of the Keurig single serve coffee system. Prior to that role, Steve gained valuable experience as Vice President, Chief Accounting Officer, and Corporate Controller at Scientific Games Corporation, a global gaming company, as well as roles at the Coca Cola Company. Arthur Anderson, and Deloitte Touche. Steve is a certified public accountant and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from Florida A&M University. He serves on the Board of Trustees of Champlain College, a private liberal arts college in Burlington, Vermont, and on the Board of Directors of the Bighorn Basin Paleontology Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to paleontology and earth science research, education, and outreach in Red Lodge, Montana. Please join me in welcoming Steve Gibbs. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Waller. When I told my 11-year-old daughter that I'd be addressing a group this large, she said, Dad, don't be boring. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to meet some of these people's kids, and I don't be known as the new girl with the boring father. So the pressure is on. I'm so glad to be here today, participating in an event with such deep, important history in Northwest Arkansas. This is my eighth week in town, and I must tell you, so far, my experience has been amazing. The educational landscape is second to none. Some of the finest public schools in the nation buttressed by numerous private, parochial, and charter schools. My daughter Ava is going to, have such an, so, going to be so excited about the opportunities here. The trouble we're going to have is, is selecting a school. The University of Arkansas, with its SEC conference sports team, vibrant arts and music scene, Dixon Street Restaurant District, and the university's academic sector known for top-notch architecture, agriculture, business law, and technology curriculums make this area a leader in education, research, and opportunities. The cultural venues of Northwest Arkansas rival big cities like Chicago and Boston. Options include concerts and plays at the AMP and Walton Art Center, as well as the Crystal Bridges Museum, which houses some of America's finest works of art. The strong economy of Northwest Arkansas is highlighted by three Fortune 400 companies, 
in several private companies, resulting in a vibrant business community and pipeline for innovation, leadership, and talent. Want to go outside? The Ozark Mountains, four state parks in Beaver Lake. And I believe that I can ride my bike to Kansas City. <laughs> Most importantly, though, are the people. Everyone is so nice and engaged and welcoming. I had the opportunity to go to my first Hogs game last week. I'm learning the lingo. When the time came to call the Hogs, I tried. I really tried. <laughs> However, by the feedback I received from the people in front of me, behind me, beside me, and in the other sections, it didn't go well. It, more, it went more like, you're not from around here, are you? And I talked to that gentleman for 20 minutes about where I was from and where he was from and what was involved in calling a hog. Um, as I was receiving advice how to properly call hogs, I made friends with a local school principal, an orthodontist, and received uh, several invitations to go to coffee and discuss living in Northwest Arkansas, as well as an ultimatum to learn the call. I still don't know how to do it correctly, but I'm working on it. And I made a lot of friends in the process. Now on to innovation. As Dean Waller mentioned, I'm a finance guy. That said, I have an important role to play when it comes to innovation, which is working with business to find resources to develop the big ideas. Innovation comes in, di in many different forms. When I was at Coca-Cola, it was new beverages, new flavors, new packaging, and new formulas. During my time at Scientific Games, it was new forms of entertainment, new ways to use pop culture in lottery games, new ways to play games using technology and online, and improve Security Inc. for scratch-off tickets. Most recently, I was at Keurig. Our system was a disruptive technology that simplified the way people make their coffee in the morning, as well as provide unlimited choice for your morning beverage. Having now joined Tyson Foods, we're innovating to sustainably feed the world for generations to come. As one of the world's largest food companies, this is both an opportunity and a responsibility for us. We're creating new products and processes and solutions to meet the wide variety of consumer needs and preferences for quality food. We know technological innovations have the power to transform the food system. That's why a couple of years ago, we launched the venture, the venture capital fund Tyson Ventures. Through Tyson Ventures, we drive innovation through direct investments in early stage startups. We believe our size and scale position us to identify the most promising opportunities at the forefront of the future of food, and then provide them with the resources to drive operational excellence. We're constantly looking for new investments and in reviewing our corn portfolio with an eye towards scalability and impact. We're also investing in innovation in our traditional business, and we're doing that right here in Northwest Arkansas. Last summer, we started work on our Tyson Manufacturing Automation Center in downtown Springdale. This will be a first-of-its-kind facility in the state of Arkansas where we'll develop and test robotics and automation technology for our plants. It'll be the third building in downtown Arkansas, I'm sorry, in third building in downtown Springdale and bring more Tyson team members and our partners from around the world to northwest Arkansas. So what's next? As I mentioned earlier, I believe Northwest Arkansas is an amazing place. The question is, can it be better? What competitive competencies do we want to develop in technology, healthcare, biotech, and life science? How do we create a competitive advantage of translating technology and innovation and often scientific discovery into commercial products and services that can be exported globally? We have all these assets. Can we monetize them with the currency being high-tech jobs, vibrant living and working communities, and high-performing talent. Is this a place where millennials want to be based on jobs, affordability, and livability? What is our succession plan for our aging population? Can this be a preferred location to retire? What about the rest of the state? As I drive around and try to determine where to make my home, I ask myself, what can I do? What can we do? so that my children and all of our children will want to make Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas their forever home. It'll take innovation to get us there and innovation to make Northwest Arkansas a place that can handle there when we get there. I'm so happy to be in Northwest Arkansas and look forward to contributing to this vibrant community. 
And to start, I look forward to leading a conversation with our esteemed panelists. There's a lot that we can learn from each of them. Thank you. Before introducing our first panelist, let me review for you how today's program will work. Each of our experts will give a brief overview of the economic outlook in the area they have been invited to talk about, the global economy, the U.S. outlook, and a, forecast for Ar and a forecast for Arkansas. After our panelists have spoken, we will have a discussion where you can submit questions on the green index cards located at your table. These will be collected just after our state and local speaker finishes his comments. Our first panelist is Carolyn Evans. Carolyn is head economist and senior data scientist at Intel Corporation. Prior to joining Intel, Carolyn held the position of associate professor of economics at Santa Clara University, senior professor of economics, senior, economic, uh, senior economist at the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve, senior staff econo economist, economist for the International Trade on the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. She is an economist. <laughs> she has published many academic articles and books in the area of international trade, political economy, global macroeconomics, and corporate finance. Carolyn holds a PhD and master's in economics and a bachelor's in East Asian languages and civilizations, all from Harvard University. She also holds a master of science from the London School of Economics. She serves on the board of directors of the National Association for Business Economics and the advisory board for the Master of Science in Business Analytics at Santa Clara University. Please help me welcome Carolyn Evans to the 2019 Business Forecast Luncheon. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to come speak to everyone today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so if you could please put up my slides, um, we could get started. Um, so I'm going to be talking about international economic perspective. So as the first speaker, I'll be taking a very high level view of what's been going on in the world economy. Um, and so my outline of the talk is, first of all, um, let's see if we can, okay, so first of all, so risk factors. Any. Um, forward-looking statements I make are subject to risk, and then a disclaimer. So anything that I talk about are solely my own views, not those of Intel Corporation or anyone associated with Intel Corporation. So that's my disclaimer. Um, okay, now for the content. So first I'm gonna talk about a snapshot of the global economy to sort of set, our, set the stage of what we're talking about when we're talking about the global economy. Um, 2018 in review, sort of looking back at what we saw in 2018 and how that puts us in the place we're in now, and then talk about the year ahead. So snapshot of the global economy. Um, so two pie charts, one for 2010 um, and one for 2017, and they both show real GDP, and GDP is sort of a measure of the overall ac economic activity of an of a economy, um, and it's controls for the effects of inflation, so it's real GDP. Um, a couple of things to point out. So first of all, the U.S. in 2010 was about 25% of the world economy. Um, world, Europe, Western Europe was about 24%, China 12%, um, and then we can sort of see that the rest of the regions around the world um, were, had the rest of the economy split up amongst them. Now what I wanted to point out is then we, when we move to 2017, you can see that China jumped from 12% of the world economy to 16% of the world economy. Um, both Western Europe and the US shrunk um, in terms of percent. So that's not, their economies didn't shrink, but as a share of that total world economy pie, both Western Europe and the US got smaller and China got, you know, they grew 4% over the course of seven years. So that's a pretty big jump. And the reason why I bring that up is because when we think about what goes on in the world economy, the U.S. is a primary driver, but China is becoming more and more of an important driver. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, that's another chart showing a map um, that has the growth rates of different regions of the economy split out. Um, and what you can see is if you look at the different colors, the darker, the darker colors represent higher rates of growth. Um, so the very dark colors you see um, is China and India 
and you know, as the colors get lighter, it's lower rates of growth. Um, and the reason why that's important is if we think about the way that the world economy is changing, those places where there's really high rates of growth are gonna sort of become bigger and bigger slices of the pie. Um, and they're also where we look to when we're thinking about um, how the economy is growing. Um, so that's the, a snapshot of where the growth we've seen has been. Okay, so flipping to the next slide. Um, this, I will now talk about what are some of the important points that we need to think about in looking back at what happened in 2018. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three things. Um, and uh, the first one is growth, okay? So what did growth look like in 2018? And I have three sources of economic forecast here. Um, and the reason I do that is because, you know, different sources have different models, different opinions about what's, going, what's been going on in the economy. So that's why if we look at a number of different sources, it gives us a pretty good view of what's been happening. So first thing to point out is that if we look at 2016, um, you know, the, the estimates range between 2.4%, 2.7%, 2017, right, over 3%. So the growth that we've been seeing really jumped a lot between 2016 and 2017. And then we look at 2018, 2018 was also very strong. Um, you know, maybe a tiny bit lower than 2017, but not by much. Um, so we've been seeing a really strong streak of growth both 2017 and 2018. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them was that China was recovering, so they had sort of had a, a slow patch and they had put some uh, stimulus into their economy. They started growing more strongly, and as that happened, it helped to generate growth around the world. Um, in the U.S. as well, um, things have been going very, very well for a number of reasons. Um, and so these really large economies around the world, the U.S., China, um, picked up a lot between 2016 and 2017, and then sort of that momentum carried through into 2018. So that's, you know, one point about 2018. Very good growth. Um, another point that is important in terms of thinking about what happened in um, 2018 is exchange rates. Um, and this chart is set up so that if the bar is above the zero line, it represents an appreciation of the foreign currency and a depreciation of the dollar. Um, so essentially, that foreign currency is getting more valuable, the dollar is getting less valuable. If the, if the line is below the zero bar, that means the foreign currency is getting less valuable, the dollar is getting more valuable. And the exchange rate is profoundly important for a number of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is for a U.S. firm exporting a good price in dollars, appreciation of the dollar makes all of their goods more expensive, so it's going to make it more difficult to export that good. Um, it also has an impact on inflation in the U.S., so when the dollar is more valuable, inflation uh, is, t is more tame in the U.S. It's also very important in terms of um, the borrowing that's done by many foreign countries when that borrowing is done in U.S. dollars. So an appreciation of the dollar, the depreciation of the local currency makes that, that debt harder to pay back. So it's a very, very important thing to keep track of. And one of the things I want to point out, and you know, we talked earlier about how 2016 had been kind of a slowdown, 2017 picked up a lot, um, is that if we look at the values of those foreign currencies, um, you can see that there was a lot of depreciation in 2016. Um, so that's the orange bar. In 2017, there was a recovery of a lot of those foreign currencies, so the dollar weakened a lot. And I'm gonna show you a chart that gives you an overall map of what's been going on with the exchange rate. Um, however, when we then turn to 2018, we see a very strong appreciation of the dollar. So if you look at those green bars, they're almost all below zero, meaning that the dollar appreciated against every major currency except the Japanese yen. Um, and so that, as I mentioned, has a lot of different implications um, and is an important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about what happened to, in 2018, what do we need to keep in mind as we're going into 2019. Um, this next chart show, you know, I, I promised to show you sort of an overall map of what's been happening with the exchange rate. So this is something called a, an effective exchange rate. And essentially what this does is it takes the exchange rate of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis all of the different countries in the world 
and it weights them by the amount with which we trade with those countries. And this chart is set up a little differently so that when it goes up, it means the dollar is stronger. When it goes down, it means the dollar is weaker. And so, you know, if we look at 2016 there, you can see a pretty big jump in what happened to the dollar in terms of the dollar was a lot stronger. Um, and then it weakened quite a bit in 2017. And when we look at, say, the U.S. manufacturing sector, um, in 2016 there was sort of a manufacturing recession, right? That's one reason why world growth was so low. But going into 2017, the dollar's weakening. Um, it's very helpful for U.S. exports. Um, it's helpful for a lot of other reasons. However, you know, as we moved into 2018, we saw quite a bit of re-strengthening of the dollar. Um, which has a lot of implications for, not only for the US, but for other countries as well. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. And I don't have it in the chart. Um, the dollar has since um, fallen back, or it has sort of fallen back a little bit in 2019. Um, but in terms of levels, right, the dollar is still relatively strong. Um, and that's a headwind when we're thinking about US growth and when we're thinking about the implications for a lot of other countries in the world. Okay, and then finally, I'll talk about trade policy. Um, I don't have a slide to show you about this, so I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, so I'm a trade economist by training, um, and you know I've been st I studied trade policy as an academic and did research, and I worked in the White House doing trade policy, um, and sort of what we've seen, the developments in trade policy over the last year, were something that I, I never would have expected to see um, in terms of. Um, what's, you know, the relationships between the United States and the rest of the world. Um, so just, you know, a brief history, we've had a section 232 on steel and aluminum, which is an action that can be taken um, to protect the national security interests of the U.S. Um, the section 301, which is the, uh, the action that was taken by the U.S. against China. Um, and, you know, we now currently have tariffs on $250 billion worth of imports from China. 25% um, for 50 billion of those, 10% for 200 billion of those. Um, and, you know, right now the countries are meeting in Washington to sort of figure out where we're going to go with this. Um, and so, you know, it, Trade policy is a really interesting topic because it hurts some people, it helps other people, but one of the um, things that we know it does is that it creates uncertainty. Um, it creates uncertainty about the business environment. Um, at one point in time, the tariffs that are 10% on, on 200 billion were supposed to go up to 25% on January 1st. It's now March 1st. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty created by um, the changes in trade policy. Um, the other impact that that has had is the implications for China. Um, and I'm going to show you in a, in a minute what the forecasts look like for 2019. Um, and just to give you a, a preview, they're, they're lower than 2018, and one of the reasons for those is um, the impact of the tariffs on China. Um, and you know, in addition to the impacts on China, it's obviously had impacts on the U.S. Um, the agriculture sector in the U.S. has been hit very hard by the tariffs um, and other industries as well. Um, the fact is the supply chains are global now, and any type of tariff is going to affect the way that supply chains work. So that trade policy is a very important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about what happened in 2018. Okay, so the year had. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I like to look at a lot of different sources um, because, uh, you know, economists, you know, in addition to on the one hand and on the other hand, right, we also have a lot of different views about what's going on in the world economy. So I just, um, these are views from a number of the leading organizations in the world who look at economics. Um, so the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD um, are, are three of them. And you know, those all sort of have a common theme. So the OECD says growth has peaked amidst escalating risks. Uh, amid escalating risks. The World Bank says global economic growth is projected to soften. The IMF talks about challenges to steady growth. Um, Oxford Economics is a little a little more sanguine, so a solid 2019 is market falls over state loss of momentum. So referring to some of the declines in the stock market that Mervyn was mentioning earlier. Um, IHS market, rising recession risks, and then, you know, I put one up there from the Federal Reserve that the Fed's Randall Quarles is upbeat on the U.S. economy. Um, so a variety of views there. 
um, and I'll show you some numbers in a minute, um, but I think sort of the, the very big picture theme that you can keep in mind is that the world economy is likely to soften in 2019, but the, the U.S., which has been doing really well and has sort of been um, the leader in terms of growth over the last you know, year, is probably going to keep being the leader. Um, so that's sort of the big picture. But let me show you some indicators now that illustrate what I've been talking about in terms of slowing growth. So these are some indicators of business sentiment. Um, so they're generally surveys of, of business um, decision makers around the world. Um, and the upper left line is something called the, the Global PMI, or Purchasing Managers Index for output. And you know, it it's reflects um, responses from business managers all around the world. So it's a good indicator of the, the global economy. And what you can see is you know, the very dark um, black line is um, the sort of overall picture. The thin dark line is manufacturing, and then services is the lighter line. And what you can see is sort of a peak at the beginning of 2018, and then it sort of started coming down since then. So this is sort of one of the reasons why we're thinking as we go into 2019, global growth is likely to be slower. And you know, one of the reasons for that is um, illustrated by the lower left, which is the output PMI for China. So this is a similar measure as in the upper left, except it's for China only. And you, know, you can see that ever since the beginning of 2018, we've had this sort of steady decline in sentiment in China. Um, and particularly the manufacturing sector there has been declining quite a bit. And I don't have this illustrated, but some measures of confidence in China sort of indicate that the manufacturing sector in China is actually shrinking. Um, and that's a combination of uh, the trade policy that we talked about earlier, but also um, the impact of some efforts that China has taken to reduce debt. Um, but that's, you know, in terms of thinking about the global economy, this reduction in, in sentiment in China is important. Um, and the upper right shows some EU and Euro area, area confidence indicators. So these are indicators for services and industrial confidence. Similar pattern that we saw this peak at the beginning of 2018 since backing off. You know, in level terms, still high, but not like we saw earlier in 2018. And then finally, the lower right is the U.S. National Federation of Independent Business Optimism Index. So this is a measure of small business confidence in the U.S. And this one's really interesting because in late 2016, you can see just a huge spike up in that confidence. And ever since then, um, up until about four months ago, we were just recording, you know, every month just about was a new record in optimism among small businesses. So small businesses in the U.S., very, very optimistic, doing very, very well. What we've seen the last four months or so is that they've started to come down, right? And you know, we sort of hadn't seen that sort of four steady months of decline in small business optimism until the last four months. Um, and so to me, what that suggests is, you know, we've sort of seen that um, backing off of very strong growth around the rest of the world uh, earlier this year. And now it looks like in the U.S. as well, maybe there's some, some backing off from uh, the very, very strong growth we've been seeing. And, you know, I don't, didn't, don't have this chart, but if we look at U.S. consumer confidence as well, um, we've seen some reductions in confidence very recently. Okay, so the last sort of set of indicators that I have, um, are important because you know they're also an indication of how strongly the world has been growing in 2017 and 2018 and you know overall you know the sense is that things are going to be weaker in 2019 and 2018 but there's still reason for optimism you know it's not like we're going to go crashing into a recession which that's just my view um, so these are employment numbers and one of the really um, interesting things about the past year has been how strong employment has been um, in the upper left, if we look at the US, uh, the blue line is job openings and the red line is unemployed. And starting in March of this year, the number of job openings exceeded the number of people who are unemployed. So that's the first time in history that ever happened. So the job market in the US is just on fire. Um, the lower left is the labor force participation rate in the US, um, still not back to where it was pre-Great um, Recession, but still has been picking up a lot. Um, the upper right shows employment in the Euro and the EU 28, record highs, right? Just really, really high levels of employment in Europe as well. And then finally, um, on the lower right is Japan, um, and the labor force size is the dark blue line, and the unemployment rate is the light blue line. And the unemployment rate is essentially at, at record lows. Um, 
the labor force side, you know, the re one reason why this is really interesting is Japan's population has been shrinking, right? So they've had a shrinking population, an aging demographic, yet somehow they've, man they've managed to increase their labor force. Um, how has that happened? Drawing more women into the labor force, increased immigration, um, older people working longer than they used to. Um, but it's a sign of how strong the labor market is, is in Japan as well. So we see very strong labor markets around the world. Um, Okay, so finally, um, what do real GDP forecasts look like for 2019? And these are all in italics because they're all forecasts. Um, and again, I give you a range of forecasts and you know, there's some technical reasons why that the levels are different, but what you can see is very, you know, across the board, across all these different sources, all looking for a decline in 2019 from 2018. Um, so, you know, make no mistake, it's still very strong growth, um, but it's going to be weaker than it was in 2018. That's sort of the general consensus on, on what we expect to happen. And I'll also mention that if we look back, say, six months ago, three months ago, all of these sources had higher forecasts than they do now. Um, so the IMF most recently last week downgraded their 2019 forecast by two percentage points, or sorry, 0.2 percentage points. Um, so, you know, we're expecting 2019 to be slower than 2018, and also that outlook has been gradually moving down as well. Um, so that's all the slides that I have, and I will pass it back to Steve to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Carolyn. <clears throat> Our second panelist is Ross Duvall. Ross Duvall is a Walton Fellow at the Walton Family Foundation, where he is enlisting experts to conduct research and bring best practices to support the foundation's philanthropic efforts. He is studying economic trends and how they impact the heartland. And he is ass assessing opportunities for regional innovation ecosystems which foster job creation, wage gains, and economic growth all for the region of our country that has no coastline. He's a former chief research officer for the Milken Institute, where he spent nearly 20 years. He has been ranked among the superstars of think tank scholars by International Economy Magazine. Duvall is transitioning to lead the New Core Economic Institute, a think and do tank whose mission will be to improve economic performance in the center of the United States. The Institute will pursue its mission through independent, data-driven research action-oriented Covingtons, and the impact policy recommendations. Ross is no stranger to this crowd. We've had the chance to hear from him at previous events. But nonetheless, please help me welcome him to the 2019 Business Forecast Luncheon. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate that kind introduction. Hopefully nobody went back and checked the accuracy of my forecasts. Uh, my former boss, Larry Klein at the University of Pennsylvania, who was a noted macroeconometric forecaster, said, Ross, my advice, forecast early and often. Eventually, you might be right. Um, so it turns out I spoke at the first business forecast luncheon in 2003, and I have watched this event grow over the, over the years to what it is now, and it is true. Mike Milken did call this the Davos of the Heartland last year. Um, so early in my career, I used to do econometric forecasting for the U.S. economy, uh, both as the U.S. lead at Wharton Econometrics and as chief economist at CSX, uh, large railroad. Um, while forecasting is no longer my day job, um, I still have my own opinions on the outlook, and I'm going to share that with you today. Also, I'm going to talk about innovation and the role that it plays in driving not only the U.S. national economy, but, but many regions uh, around the country as well. And also I want to thank uh, Jonas Cruz on our staff who helped put this presentation together. And he did a great job on these maps. And uh, Carolyn made me feel warm and fuzzy when I saw all those maps. My undergraduate degree is in geography, so uh, that was a, an added bonus. So I'm going to talk about innovation and long-term growth first, talk a little bit about research and development, the role that entrepreneurship and access to early stage risk capital plays, uh, talk about human capital. I never give a presentation without speaking about the role of human capital, especially at an event put on by the University of Arkansas. Talk a lot about the STEM workforce and the role that it plays, 
technology dynamicism. And then I will talk about the U.S. outlook, and I'll drill down on very specific sectors from the consumer to business, housing, trade. I used to be a trade economist as well, Carolyn, so we share that, but you're more astute at it than I am. Uh, financial, talk a little bit about the financial risks, and then I'm going to give you a, a summary outlook. Um, overall, I would agree with what Carolyn showed. Uh, the U.S. economy last year grew at about 3 percent, a little bit less than some of those estimates, but they're too optimistic on the fourth quarter number, in my opinion. Uh, it's not going to be as strong as many of them believe. So talking about the long term, uh, we're going to look at the research and development uh, and innovation capacities of the United States. This is the raw material of a knowledge-based economy. Uh, research and development really form the intellectual property that can be converted to a private sector business, either through an existing firm or through a startup. Um, the primary sources of R&D funding come from the federal government, uh, private industry, as well as universities. Federal funding is principally geared towards uh, scientific advance advancement, kind of the basic sciences and medical research, but subsequently it is applied either at universities or in the private business sector. Um, corporations provide the bulk of R&D investment in the U.S., typically between 60 to 65 percent, as you can see in this chart. Uh, but I would say that even though the university line might be a lot lower, the university R&D is playing an increasingly critical role in determining the competitiveness of the U.S. economy overall. Large corporations account for the bulk of that. You know who they are, the Intels, the Apples, the Googles, you go down the list. We're still large innovators. But we also have an ecosystem of very young, innovative firms that are always changing the game and have kept us ahead on the technological frontier. But we have to be very careful not to become overcomplacent in the United States. China this year, by my estimation, will actually invest more in research and development on a purchasing power parity basis than the U.S. does. This will be the first time ever that that has occurred. China is putting big bets in on 5G mobile technology, uh, robotics, AI, biotech, and even uh, seed breeding, as the Chinese would call it. Okay, so the first map. Uh, this is what we call the research and development inputs. It's part of the State Technology and Science Index that I helped develop while at the Milken Institute. My former staff just updated this about a month ago, so this is all new data that, of course, has been put into, you guessed it, a map. Uh, so the color coding first. If you're in dark blue, it means you're in the top 10. If you're in light blue or light gray, you're in the bottom 10, and then you have the gradients in between. Uh, and we will follow Utah on this list because they are one of the leaders, I think, in public policy advancement. Um, basically, the idea is because knowledge is generated, transmitted, and shared much more efficiently in close geographic proximity, new knowledge has a tendency to cluster within a geographic area. If you want to develop a new cluster, research and development is critical. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of research universities that are committed to commercialization and technology transfer and working with the private business sector. They're the glue that helps form these innovation clusters and keeps them together over the long term. There are 18 different indicators that are included in this from R&D at the federal level, uh, among industries, academic, uh, as well as National Science Foundation awards. Uh, I'm getting into some technical jargon here, small business innovation rewards. And everything is normalized relative to the size of each state's economy. Um, Utah was 11th on this, and you'll see as they progress through these different measures. Entrepreneurs and early stage risk funding are critical to the process of company formation and growth, and really allows our nation to create a pace of economic growth that creates jobs for its citizens. This chart shows you the share of total employment in the U.S. that's represented by young firms. Young firms is defined by firms five years of age or less, 
And I've been doing a bit more econometric work looking at this is a leading indicator. And if you look at metropolitan areas, states, micropolitan areas, this is one of the best long-term indicators of growth, and it is for the U.S. as well. And unfortunately, that share has fallen over time. Uh, the economy today is less dynamic. Startup rates have declined longer term. So it is an area of concern. Um, the good news is that it does appear that it bottomed out sometime around 2012, but you have to be very careful. This could just be a cyclical recovery. So it is one of my main concerns is that young share has fallen. So what it indicates is your ability to start new companies, scale them up. So at the end of five years, you get a good sense. You have more companies coming into the pipeline. There's a higher probability that some of them are going to be successful and go from employing 25 people to 250 people. And that really is where net job creation comes in this country. Uh, this, once again, is another indicator. It looks at the state level for entrepreneurship and venture capital, a whole range of things. Dark blue, you're in the top 10. Uh, here you see Utah, for example, is third in the country. It actually is past Colorado and just behind California and Massachusetts. I, I fundamentally, fundamentally believe a new conceptual framework for state and regional economic growth must be developed that explicitly recognizes the role of entrepreneurship in fostering job creation. And the states that are in kind of gray or light blue on this map have challenges in creating those new companies, do not have the dense entrepreneurial ecosystems that a lot of other places do. Now this gives me great pleasure to point out that Arkansas for the first time on any of these measures has moved out of the bottom 10. All right, so don't laugh, let me give yourself applause. So it's hard to accomplish that because there's a lot of stock measures in here. Once again, I'm an economist, I have to talk stock and flows. So those, change, those things change slowly over time. So Arkansas is doing better, but I'd rather it be Utah. All right, human capital. It is a country's most important asset as well as regions. And it's really the accumulation of skills over many years, typically measured by degrees, although I would argue if you do cognitive testing, it's not necessarily just about degrees, but it's usually a pretty good indicator of human capital. This has risen from just about 11% for the adult population in 1970 to, uh, in 2017, 34%. So a dramatic rise in the percent of the adult population with a bachelor's degree, uh, and it's not just people, individuals that benefit from this investment in human capital, the country does, and firms benefit. There's been a lot of analysis that's been done, and I've done some myself, that shows that companies that invest in human capital have higher sales growth, higher market share in their industries, higher capital investment, their productivity levels are higher, as well as their market capitalization. You guessed it, here's a state map of some of those same indicators. Um, this has both stock and flow measures. So once again, a stock, the percent of the adult population with a bachelor's degree or above. It has flow measures, which measure recent graduation rates as a share overall. So you can look at engineers, are they graduating at a higher rate? Uh, gives you a measure of long-term flows. And uh, Utah was fifth on this measure. And this is about utilizing the human capital that you create, but you also have to retain it. Because this isn't about just where people are educated, it is about where they reside and how well they've done. Utah was fifth on this measure. Uh, just 16 years ago, Utah was 17th on that measure. Tremendous increase. Let's get into STEM a little bit. Uh, the intensity of the technology and science workforce indicates whether the U.S. overall has the capacity uh, for technical talent in order to compete against China and other emerging countries such as India. You need technical talent to take research and development 
and commercialize it, either in an existing company or a new startup. And while today STEM jobs represent only 5% of all uh, people employed in the United States, they are so critical to this process. It has risen from about 2% in 1960. Today there are 6.3 million people employed in STEM occupations. This shows you a, a state measure that's very similar to this on tech and science workforce. Uh, this looks at which regions uh, have those STEM workers. It allows the innovation ecosystems to be denser, to be more fluid in the interaction, and so there's a lot more collaboration that occurs. And it's important to realize that company's most valuable asset walks out of the building every night and it's not reflected on the balance sheet, and uh, I think that needs to be changed. Utah, once again, has improved dramatically uh, in recent years. I won't go into the details as to why that happened, maybe for a future event. Somebody wants me to speak about that. This shows you what we call advanced services uh, and their critical success, or their critical importance to job creation overall. There are 50 manufacturing, services and energy industries that are included in this, and basically two measures determine whether you're in this category. Uh, these are companies that invest the most in R&D relative to sales and have the highest concentration of STEM workers. So the combination of those two. Uh, advanced manufacturing stems from motor vehicles to aerospace to medical devices to biopharmaceuticals. Um, and these are the industry where the U.S. is still at the vanguard in manufacturing and leading in export. However, due to productivity increases due to automation, uh, the use of robotics, it does limit job growth in these sectors, even though there's been overall strong growth. It's really been what we call advanced services that have been creating the bulk of the jobs uh, in this category. These are digital technologies, information, processing, AI, web design, scientific research, data sciences, a whole long list. Uh, these are the industries that are creating high paying jobs in the United States. And advanced services employed 1.7 million people in the US uh, last year. This is a snapshot of all those things I just tried to show you. Um, that looks at advanced industries and what they account for in terms of innovation. So starting on the left, those 50 industries represent 8.7% of U.S. employment, but 17.2% of GDP. They represent 60% of exports by value added. They hire 80% of engineers in the United States. They account for 81.2% of all patents generated among firms, and 89% of all private sector R&D in the United States. That's why they're still competitive. A, a tech and science uh, indicator as well at the state level. This measures technology and science employment, um, payroll and jobs in the sector, new business formations and technology industries. And it's really these newly formed companies that can tap into this technology talent that allow research and innovation to be brought to the marketplace. Um, these are serial entrepreneurs that have been in the tech space. They've done it before, they do it again, they mentor others, and you have an ecosystem that kind of lives and breathes. You live in the middle of the, the most dense one in the, in the world, Carolyn. Uh, we're hoping to bring more of that to the center of the country. You see, if you look closely, that Utah is first on this category now. This looks at more recent growth figures in technology. Utah has had the fastest growth in technology in the country over the past few years. It's not California. It's it's not Massachusetts, it has been the state of Utah. So this takes all those different measures uh, and puts them together in the state technology or science and technology index. 
Massachusetts was still number one. It has been every year since 2002. Um, Colorado was second, Maryland was third, California was fourth, and Utah has moved up to fifth. In 2002, the first time this was created, uh, Utah was 10th, and over a period of just 16 years, moving up that rapidly is a remarkable accomplishment. Okay, this is my busy chart. I've just told you those things are important, but how can I demonstrate it? Well, one way to do so is to look at what does it mean for people and places. So this shows you across the 50 states, uh, average annual pay, and the ability of the State Technology and Science Index to predict or explain the variation in average pay per employee. And what you find is that you can explain 75% of the variation in average annual pay across the 50 states solely by how well a state performed on that State Technology and Science Index. And my former mentor, Larry Klein at Wharton, would have been very proud of this relationship uh, because it meant, it meant that I listened. Okay, let me move to the U.S. outlook a little bit. What's ahead? I'll kind of drill into various sectors. Carolyn kind of gave you the overview. Um, this shows you a chart of disposable income growth. And despite all the headwinds that the U.S. has faced from um, financial markets being a bit wobbly entering this year uh, to some would call it trade wars with China, uh, the government shutting down, uh, the economy is still rolling along in a fairly strong clip. Um, I would say that the risk of recession this year is about 25 percent, maybe increasing to 35 percent in 2019. Job growth was a strong again this month that caught, caught most people by surprise at positive 304,000 jobs. I think that'll get revised down lower, is my sense. Uh, but still, uh, it is a very strong number, and we just had the hundredth straight month of job expansion in the United States. Uh, just a remarkable accomplishment. Also, manufacturing added um, 250,000 jobs last year. That's the most jobs U.S. manufacturing has added since 1995. That's a big deal, folks. Uh, we've also had a slowdown in home building, but still, labor markets have been improving, unemployment dipped down to 3.7 percent, and real disposable income has moved from growing at about 1 percent in the annual rate in mid-2016 to about 3 percent today. What this has enabled is consumers are willing to spend and they're able as well. So fueled by those job and wage gains that we've seen, this shows you consumer sentiment uh, and consumer spending. And consumer debt servicing burdens have risen a little bit, but they peaked at 13.1% in uh, 2009, and now are still below 10%. So consumers' are, balance sheets are still in pretty good shape overall. And consumers have propelled the economy forward. This doesn't show you the last dip down in consumer confidence. Uh, in January from the conference board, it did dip down. That really is related to the government closure or partial closure. Uh, and consumers apparently still continue to spend throughout the holidays, and e-commerce sales were very strong, although it's important to recognize e-commerce sales are only about 10 percent of total retail sales still to this day, so there's ample room for more uh, activity based on the web. This shows you business investment. Uh, after kind of tax and regulatory reform, small business optimism has been very high. It's fallen off a little bit in the past few months, but real business investment for the first three quarters of 2018 advanced at an annual rate of 7.5%. Uh, business tax reform played a role in this. Uh, in my sense is if trade tensions are not escalated and the, the challenges with tariffs being placed on Chinese imports and uh, the retaliation against our exports, I think we'd have seen even stronger business investment. So higher oil prices in the year earlier in 2018 helped. They've come down significantly. That headwind or that tailwind will no longer be behind us. Investment growth will slow down, but I think it still will remain fairly strong. 
Home sales, this is a sector that deteriorated in 2018. Housing affordability declined, mortgage rates rose from roughly 4% to 5%. Higher housing prices made them less affordable. And also tax reform played a role here because the tax benefits to home ownership have declined because the standard deduction has risen. So a lot of people can't itemize like they used to. And then when you combine that with a new cap on mortgage interest deductibility at 750,000, which affects the coast disproportionately, housing activity in California, New York, along the coast has really begun to fall off. And we've seen some employment losses in those related sectors. Uh, this looks at exports and imports, and trade has been a drag on the U.S. economy over the past few years. Uh, stronger growth in the U.S. relative to the world, as well as Carolyn showed you, the higher value of the dollar have really affected those numbers. Uh, the good news is that uh, President Trump and President uh, Xi Jinping decided to declare truce for about 90 days, kind of a cooling off period to see if they could reach uh, at least some moderation in views. And um, let me just say that, you know, China has been circumventing World Trade Organization rules since they joined. There have been several administrations that have been trying to encourage them to change their behavior. Uh, that has not been fruitful. And they have not upheld, for example, opening up the financial services market as they said they would. And it is pay to play when you're a U.S. company going into China, you have to hand over your intellectual property to gain market access. That's still a problem today. To me, it's much more important than any of the tr true trade issues of goods. It's the services and the intellectual property. And so, rightly or wrongly, we'll see in terms of how the negotiations play out, but Trump decided that it was time to send a message that the U.S. really meant business. You're gonna adhere to these pledges that you made, or you're gonna face consequences. We'll see if that works out. Uh, an important signpost is someone who used to be on my advisory council, who's the Treasury Secretary today, Steve Mnuchin. When he's out in public making comments or floating comments that are attributed to him, it means that uh, the optimists on trade are starting to carry the, the day, if you will, because in the background, Leitzinger and Peter Navarro are whispering in the president's ear, and they are both tr China trade hawks. I think that's putting it mildly. Very quickly, a little bit on the federal government. This shows you the federal spending, or the deficit, I should sh say. Uh, it, unfortunately, when Congress decided to reform the business tax system, they did not look at trying to make it revenue neutral. It was anything but revenue neutral. And Congress has also increased discretionary spending and defense spending at the same time, uh, related to a massive tax cut. And the budget deficit has grown from $439 billion in 2015, when it was 2.4% of GDP. Today, it's going to be a trillion in 2019, and 5% of GDP. Um, so the other way to look at this is fiscal policy is highly stimulative and will probably help growth this year and next year. I don't think we have to be as concerned about rising federal debt levels uh, as we might have thought 20 years ago. I used to believe this fervently, but I, you know, I believe in evidence, and the statistical evidence says that it doesn't hinder economic growth as much as we previously thought. What's really important is what you do with those deficit dollars? Are you investing them in such things as R&D, or are you putting them forth towards current consumption expenditures? And we haven't done enough investing. Let me wrap this up quickly. Um, the Fed is starting to unwind its balance sheet. Uh, many on Wall Street are very worried about this, and it's one of the main reasons why the Fed is on pause or being data dependent, maybe truly data dependent for a while. Um, the, the balance sheet of the Fed got to four and a half trillion dollars uh, in 2015, and by my estimate, the balance sheet should probably hold maybe three trillion of mortgage securities and treasuries. So it has been allowing them to run off as they mature. This has caused many bond traders uh, sleepless nights in Wall Street, and I think I've kind of spoken to the Fed to get them to go to pause. 
Um, so we'll see how long they allow the balance sheet to run off that quickly. The yield curve, all right, so this looks at the 10-year treasury bond relative to the three-month treasury note. And typically, when short-term rates go above long-term rates in the US, a recession occurs 12 months later. Now, the good news is the curve is not truly inverted yet, but it's so close, uh, it could happen in the next few months. Now, I think it matters why the yield curve inverts. Uh, past inversions coincided with the Federal Reserve System that probably moved the Fed funds rate above the, the long-term equilibrium. In other words, monetary policy was strict, restrictive. Today, that's not the case. Also, U.S. long-term yields remain suppressed because other central banks around the world have not normalized monetary policy. You have German boons, Japanese long-term rates below 1%. And U.S. long-term rates, to some extent, are anchored uh, to those to those for those countries' uh, bond rates. So let me just conclude, just to give you some numbers. Uh, Carolyn gave you some. I think GDP growth was about 2.9 percent last year. Um, probably going to be about 2.6 percent this year. It's important to keep in mind that fiscal policy is still very stimulative. Um, probably going to add half a percentage point to GDP growth this year. Employment growth will begin to slow down this year. Uh, I think business investment will not be quite as robust as it has been. It will moderate somewhat. Imports will remain strong, uh, kind of the lagged effect of the dollar. One of the big risks is what happens to those trade talks with China. Can President Trump decide to declare victory, at least in the short term, and not put more tariffs on the other 250 billion of Chinese imports? We shall see. I appreciate your patience for allowing me to uh, give you my own views on the economy, and let's hear about what's happening in Arkansas. Thank you, Ross. It's now my pleasure to introduce Marvin, <laughs> Mervin Jabraj, Director of the Center for Business and Economic Research. He is an exceptional source for business and economics related expertise that so many rely on to understand how the national and regional issues impact Northwest Arkansas and Arkansas as a whole. He makes presentations that pass on CBER's expertise directly to over 5,000 individuals annually and tens of thousands more hear and see his eco economic analysis and commentary through TV, radio, and print media. His work has been noted by the state's business media. The Northwest Arkansas Business Journal recognized Mervyn as one of its Fast 15, and Arkansas Business put him on a list of 20 in their 20s. Are you in your 20s? Ten years ago, <laughs> Arkansas Business put him on a list of 20 in their 20s. He's a member of the National Association of Business Economics and serves on the board of the directors for the Association of University Business and Economic Research. Mervyn's presentation today will focus on the outlook for the Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas economy in 2019. Please welcome Mervyn Jebrush. That was four years ago. So I'm going to get right into it. Uh, we'll start with our uh, look at how the Arkansas economy did in 2018 and then uh, look at what our forecast for 2019 is and where we expect uh, growth to be. Now, it's a little hard uh, in the afternoon after eating lunch to listen to three economists. So there's plenty of coffee and sugar at your table, so feel free to imbibe. Um, so if we want to start and look at what we did in uh, 2018, I'll start with the good news uh, for Arkansas and then we'll uh, slide into some negative news, and then I promise I will finish with good news again, so you will leave feeling somewhat uh, more pleased. Uh, so if you look at the unemployment rates, this is our great bit of good news for this state. Uh, the nation as a whole, just under 4% unemployment. Uh, Arkansas, about 3.5. Northwest Arkansas, about 2.5. And, and so if you remember what we talked about in 2017, we thought that the unemployment rates, both for the state, the country, and uh, the region were fairly low and as low as they were going to go. We were able to sustain those low unemployment rates, and that's great news for the state. It's especially great for uh, wages for workers. 
Uh, after long decades of wage stagnation, we've finally seen adjusting for inflation under 2% wage growth for Arkansas workers. So the low unemployment rates sustained over two years have really raised wages for workers, and that's great news. If you look at the unemployment rates across the board in our metro areas here in Arkansas, uh, you'll see Pine Bluff at the top there, about 4.5%. In the middle, in the red line, that's Fort Smith. So they kind of mirror the state average, about 3.5%. At the very bottom, the blue line is Northwest Arkansas, about 2.5%. So what you saw in 2017 is unemployment rates were still going down across our metro areas. Most of 2018, in all these metro areas, the unemployment rate essentially held steady at the lower rates, and that was a great bit of good news. So now I'm going to take my little break from the good news and talk about, if you look just under the unemployment rates to figure out why the unemployment rate went down and stayed down, that's when you get to looking at the labor force and labor force participation rates in Arkansas and in our metro areas. So the blue line shows you labor force growth in the country, and you'll see that that was positive. And the red line shows you labor force growth, which wasn't growth, uh, for Arkansas, and you'll see that we spent most of 2018 in the negative. That means people left the labor force. So what does that mean? It means that instead of the unemployment rate going down because people are entering the labor force and finding work, or people that were unemployed were finding work, instead what we saw happen across Arkansas and some of our metro areas was that people who were unemployed left the labor force without finding work. So that's sort of the bad reason for you to see uh, unemployment declines. So these are the three growing regions of the state in Arkansas. I have Northwest Arkansas, Central Arkansas, and Northeast Arkansas on here. And you'll see that the labor force growth rate is not nearly as strong as it used to be between 2014 and 2017, but it's largely positive in 2018. Both, all of these regions briefly dipped into the negative in uh, 2018, but have at least somewhat moderately grown uh, their labor force through most of 2018. What we don't uh, like to see is this particular chart here. These are the other three metro areas, uh, Fort Smith, Hot Springs, and Pine Bluff, and you'll see that they had large negative declines in labor force uh, in these regions. They spent most of the year losing about 3% of their labor force, and that is the piece that concerns us. So. Last year, I stood up here and I bemoaned the fact that Arkansas's labor force participation rate, in spite of the record low unemployment rate, was rooted to 58%. I guess I didn't specify in which direction I wanted it to go. It went down further from 58%, so I guess at least we're not rooted to 58 anymore, but we're stuck at 57-something, which isn't exactly great. And you'll see that both the country as a whole, the labor force participation rate has steadied for the nation hasn't improved for Arkansas, and this looks at the labor force as a whole, but the same story holds for people in the prime age uh, population between 25 and 54 people we think should be in the workforce. And so a lot of people have theorized about why these people are not in the workforce. Some of them have argued that, well, computer games have gotten so good that all of these people are just staying home and playing Fortnite and taking the W or the L, depending on what's going on. But I think it's really not that. I mean, we've seen some reports come out in recent uh, years that show the effect of the opioid crisis here in the state and the country. And one particular report showed that since 99, Arkansas lost more than 40,000 people from the labor force solely due to the opioid crisis. So until we deal with some of those larger structural issues, we're not likely to see a significant improvement here in our labor force participation rate. So how did the state as a whole do? I'm showing you non-farm employment. Uh, obviously, farm employment was not on there, and our farmers took a little bit of a beating last year in the trade war. Uh, but this is what non-farm employment has looked like in 2018. The red line is the forecast for 2019. And in 2018, the growth in Arkansas employment was about half what it was in, between 2014 and 2017. In 2018, we added about 10,000 jobs, a 1% growth rate. Previous years was about a 2% growth rate and a little more than 20,000 jobs in each of those years. So we're growing as a state, but growing at a slower pace than we were between 2014 and 2017. And our forecast for 2019 is about 10 to 11,000 jobs that will be added 
in this state. So when I say statewide employment growth, it makes it seem like the state as a whole grew jobs. Uh, but this next chart shows you where exactly the job growth really occurred. I have metro areas in blue and non-metro areas in red. And you'll see that almost all of that job growth in 2018 came from the metro areas. And the metro areas would add 10, 12, 15,000 jobs each month, looking at a year-over-year -year basis. And the non-metro areas would then subtract three, four, five thousand 5,000 jobs from that total, which gets you to about that 10,000 number. Um, and when I say metro areas, I'm being very generous with that definition too. It does say six metro region. It really was three metros, and it's anyone's guess what it was. It's Northwest Arkansas, Central Arkansas, and Jonesboro would add all the jobs. Uh, Pine Bluff, Fort Smith, and Hot Springs would either lose a few or stay steady, and then the non-metro areas would lose a lot of jobs. And so the only improvement we saw was in December of 2018 when the state added 16,000 jobs, and there was slightly positive growth in the non-metro areas and a lot more job growth uh, across our six metro areas. So what sectors in Arkansas did well? At the top you see construction. A lot of this is uh, happening right here in northwest Arkansas and is reflected on the state, but there's plenty of construction across the state uh, in several different sectors. Uh, for all the builders in the room here, you're having a good year and you know it. Um, I'm expecting you to have champagne on ice for us next year. Uh, professional business services has done well in Arkansas. Now this is a sector that we really like typically here in Northwest Arkansas because it has some high paying jobs, professional technical services, corporate headquarters jobs, but it also has administrative and temp jobs in it. And at the state level, almost all of that job growth in professional and business services was in temp jobs. So it's good that we are seeing more employment, but they're not necessarily in the best sectors that we would expect. Manufacturing grew in Arkansas as a whole. Again, we ex saw a lot more growth in employment in non-durable goods manufacturing than in durable goods manufacturing. And in particular, I think we had some lost opportunities with the trade war. So when the steel and aluminum tariffs were announced, we saw a lot of cancellations for plans for companies that were gonna expand their production here in Arkansas. And then when the series of retaliatory tit-for-tat tariffs happened, uh, several other companies as well have indefinitely delayed their plans for opening up plants here in Arkansas, especially in regions, uh, rural parts of the state that could really use those manufacturing jobs. Um, I look at the biggest metro in our state here in central Arkansas and see their job growth. And if you look at the very end of that chart, you'll see that at the end of 2018, the growth rate in central Arkansas has sort of doubled. Um, they grew from, they went from growing about 1% to about 2%, growing about 3,500 jobs to about 7,000 or more jobs at the end of the year. So they had a very good 2018 uh, compared to 2017. And if you look at what sectors those jobs were in, again, professional business services was the highest in terms of jobs gained. Now you don't have this level of detail that shows you which sectors in professional business services grew. But seeing as how the statewide growth was largely in those temp jobs, we're going to guess that that's where uh, that growth really happened as well. Education and health services. Healthcare is a really big sector of the central Arkansas economy. They added about 2,500 uh, jobs last year in that particular sector. Leisure and hospitality did well. Trade transportation utilities was positive in 2018. So after losing jobs in retail trade through all of 2017 and the first quarter of 2018, uh, at least in central Arkansas, we started seeing job growth in that particular sector. So that's where, you know, so you're looking at 10, 12,000 jobs uh, at various points last year. You can add up here in your heads where those jobs are coming from, 7,000 or so, six, 7,000 from central Arkansas. And we'll take a little quick tour around the state. Um, here, when I set this up, I guess I subconsciously put them in order of driving distance from uh, Fayetteville, but uh, it roughly works out. Fort Smith, Hot Springs, Pine Bluff, and then Jonesboro. And if you look at Fort Smith, they lost about, you know, 0.2% uh, employment there, so that's about two to 300 jobs uh, lost on an annual basis in Fort Smith. A lot of those jobs over the year were lost in manufacturing and retail trade. And moving over to Hot Springs, they added about the same percentage of jobs, added about two to 300 jobs. And a lot of those jobs, again, 
were the places they lost were in the services sector, the places they gained were in the goods producing sector. Pine Bluff lost about half a percent in employment over the year. And again, the goods producing sector there was steady. There was no change in employment there, and all those jobs were lost in the services producing region. Jonesboro is obviously the other shining star in our state. Strong employment growth, 2.3%, 1,300 jobs, fairly solid growth in both goods producing and service producing sectors. So if you're keeping up with the math in your head, there was 7,000 from Little Rock, uh, about 1,300 from Jonesboro. Those are your positive additions to employment in any given year. Which brings us to Northwest Arkansas, and I promised I'd come back to the good news at the end, so here we are. Uh, Northwest Arkansas had a pretty good year in 2018, not as good like the rest of the state uh, as we had between 2014 and 2017. Uh, so we added about 5,000 jobs last year, 5,500, 5, close to 6,000 jobs last year. And it was a little bit of a slower pace than we saw in 2017, 2017 employment growth in Northwest Arkansas was about 3.1%. Uh, in 2018, it was about 2.3%, so still among the strongest in the state, but compared to ourselves, a little bit slower than where we used to be. Uh, our forecast obviously calls for about another 5,000 jobs added in Northwest Arkansas over 2019. And, uh, you know, I still think of Northwest Arkansas as a place where people come to for jobs. Obviously, there are, we have a lot of really nice things which, are people, which bring people here as well, but the people that move here tend to move for jobs. So given that our employment growth has slowed down a little, I would expect that our population growth in 2018 and 2019 is going to be a little bit slower than what we saw between 2014 and 2017 when we added about 12,000 people every year. The other big thing is uh, we are now an Arkansas-only MSA. McDonald County in Missouri is no longer part of our MSA. It's just Washington, Benton, and Madison County in Arkansas. I didn't hear any celebrations, so I guess you guys like Missouri. <laughs> Misery. Um, <laughs> The change in sectors, uh, where do we see that job growth? Again, construction, you see that grew about 8% consistently through the year. We have plenty of evidence for all of this. There are homes being built, there are apartments being built, there are little offices and retail establishment, roads, the universities on a building spurt, all kinds of building happening across uh, this region, which is great news. Um, now, this shows you the change in employment from December 2017 to December 2018, so there's a lot of seasonality involved with which jobs do well in December versus other parts of the year. So actually, the second strongest employment growth was in leisure and hospitality, which grew about 5.5% uh, through most of 2018. Now, this should come as no surprise to you. We have made tremendous investments in our museums, our restaurants, our bars, our breweries. We've also made a lot of investment in a very active outdoor lifestyle. So if you want mountain biking parks or kayaking parks, we have that. If you want to go further and you want climbing walls and climbing gyms, we have that. Trampoline parks, we have that. So basically, if you really want to break your bones, <laughs> Northwest Arkansas has options for you. Which brings me to the third fastest growing sector in Northwest Arkansas, which is healthcare. It was all orthopedic work. Uh, they have been setting bones for as long as they could see. So really, we could build a specialty here, come to this really nice place to break your bones, and then we'll set them for you too. Uh, I'm kidding, it wasn't really orthopedic. It was mostly just general uh, medical services to deal with the population growth. That's where we really saw the growth in uh, health services here in Northwest Arkansas. Manufacturing employment grew quite a bit. Most of that was in non-durable goods again. And uh, the sector of trade, transportation, utilities there ha has struggled in Northwest Arkansas. Retail trade continued to lose jobs through all of 2018. Uh, retail trade lost about 1.5%. Wholesale trade gained about 3.5%, so kind of canceled out uh, most of those job losses in the larger retail trade sector. But by and large, these are the sectors that you see uh, employment growth in that we would expect to see these additional 5,000 jobs in 2019 to come from. 
So when we think about the state as a whole and Northwest Arkansas, and you see this employment starting to slow down, the question is where do we get more employment from? How do we continue to grow our economy? And Ross alluded to this as well, and we'll talk about it in the panel. And the answer to that is more investments in research and innovation. And I see three things that we should do as a state and a region, stuff that we're already doing, stuff that we should expand. One of that is it you know, additional investments in resources. Northwest Arkansas has a lot of resources for entrepreneurs, for mentorship, for advice. Uh, Little Rock does too, but not necessarily all the other parts of the state. They're usually just left with their small business development center, which provides a lot of advice and support to entrepreneurs, but they don't have the level of support that we have here in Northwest Arkansas. Another important aspect, especially for other parts of the state, is broadband access. So you're not gonna get this entrepreneurship and innovation economy unless the rural parts of the state are connected to broadband as well. And I think of the other issue as being pipeline. Um, obviously, in Northwest Arkansas, we have the university and research, but we also have accelerator programs. We have a supply chain accelerator here in Northwest Arkansas, a FinTech accelerator in Little Rock, but not any more of these programs through the rest of the state, which is something we would need to invest in. Uh, research out of the university has grown to a record level, 175 million in 2018, which has uh, improved our ranking relative to other universities, but is still much lower than where we are compared to our peers that we measure ourselves against. But the university has a goal to actually double this figure, which is not gonna be possible without state support as well as support from private industry. And so it can't just be the University of Arkansas doing research, it has to come to all of our four-year universities across the state doing additional research and then importantly, converting this research to commercialization and turning them into businesses. And that's where the real job growth happens for the rest of the state. And I'm sure we'll talk about that some more. And of course, the last thing that Northwest Arkansas has done a lot of work on is making the state really attractive. Uh, to entrepreneurs, so you see a lot of amenities, uh, all our downtowns are developed. Other parts of the state are doing that as well. You see Fort Smith with the Marshalls Museum and their downtown development. Uh, El Dorado has a great downtown that they have worked on, so this idea of making their place livable to attract entrepreneurs is really important as well. The last slide I'll leave you with is again mostly positive. You see median household income, and we're all headed in the right direction, so that's a good good sign there. At the very top is the U.S. and how our metro areas compare, and you see Northwest Arkansas right after that, followed by Central Arkansas, and then Fort Smith and Jonesboro and Pine Bluff at the very bottom. So if we continue to invest in a state with research, innovation, entrepreneurship, we would expect to see incomes rise across our state, and as more jobs are created, and I'm sure that's going to be some of the subject of our discussion for our panels. but. If you have questions for our wonderful panelists, they're a great bunch of people to talk to. Uh, write them down on those cards that are at your table and wave them, and uh, someone from our staff will come pick them up from you and bring them up to our moderator. Thank you very much. All right. Ross. It's been 10 years since our last financial crisis. What do you see as the most underappreciated risk to the U.S. economic outlook? I know I asked you uh, to go ahead and query that question towards me. Uh, a little pessimistic, but um, here's the way I would view it. Um, this has largely gone unnoticed in the United States in financial markets, but what are called leveraged loans made to companies with a lot of debt on their balance sheet already. Uh, that has risen from roughly um, 500 billion to 1.3 trillion in those loans outstanding over just the past uh, five or six years. They have been securitized in the collateral, uh, collateralized loan obligations and they're sitting on the balance sheets of a lot of places that if you examine them, it looks very similar to the subprime mortgage crisis, the same size, actually the exact same size. When you combine that, um, looking at the, I will call the high yield bond market, some might call it the junk bonds, you know, really, you know, triple C or less, and that comes to about 2.7 trillion that's sitting out there on balance sheets. 
And while overall the corporate financial sector, I think, is very strong, my fear is that in the next recession, uh, we will find out um, that there's a lot more of that debt out there than is being recognized. And it, it is unlikely to trigger a severe recession, but it will exacerbate one that's triggered by other factors. And uh, I know the regulators at the Fed are looking at that very closely, but I don't think it's recognized within the financial sector as extensively as it should be. Thank you. Carolyn, what is the biggest long-run challenge faced by the large economies in the world? Um, it's demographics, is what I would say. So many uh, large economies in the world have aging populations. Um, Japan is sort of at the forefront in terms of this. And as the population ages, you have sort of fewer people um, of working age to support the rest of the population. Um, and it also makes sort of that, the growth and innovation that Ross mentioned more difficult. So Japan's sort of at the forefront of that. A number of European countries, um, Italy is an example, are also facing that issue. And China's actually facing that issue as well. Um, their one-child policy they had in place for a long time is sort of um, exacerbated the challenge to a certain extent um, in the U.S. also. So I would say when we think very long term, that's a challenge that all these economies are facing. Thank you. The labor force participation rate in the U.S. as well as in Arkansas has been abysmal. What can we do about that? Yeah, I mean, if you look at what, you know, recently we've seen statistics about labor force participation for the U.S. and you see women's labor force participation rates are lower than men's, again, especially among the younger women. And we've seen something very similar here in Northwest Arkansas where the labor force participation rate for women with children at home between zero and six is much lower than even the rest of the state. And when it comes down to it, it looks like childcare, the cost of childcare is really affecting labor force participation rates. So when we look at those overall labor force participation rates and wonder why we're not seeing the same level of participation, some of it in some regions has to do with the lack of availability of childcare. But I think the bigger problem across the state uh, for 25 to 54 year olds in particular, you're seeing opioid crisis is a much larger problem for the labor force participation rate. There's been a lot of ink spilt about the problem, but not a lot of action taken to deal with the problem. And these are difficult problems. Dealing with opioid addiction is not easy. It's not a one year fix. It's not a two year fix. It's going to take a while, but it requires us to invest in those strategies to deal with it today yesterday, probably, at least a few years ago, but we haven't done it yet. I would put one other factor with that. I think the opioid crisis is playing a, a large role, especially amongst males between the ages of 25 and 54 in staying out of the labor force. But I would include the obesity rate. Uh, it's truly the double pillar. You put the opioid crisis on top of the uh, obesity challenges we face. And in those parts of the country, you look at the county level, they have the lowest labor force participation rates. And it's costing many of these states a lot of money to treat the various conditions related to obesity, the deaths you lose human capital from in the opioid crisis. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump was touting that he's working to fix the opioid crisis by getting China to clamp down on fentanyl coming into the US. I think he's a bit premature, but he likes to take credit for things that he doesn't really deserve. Uh, so. Hopefully that agreement will be biting and we will see the fentanyl epidemic in terms of imports coming from China diminish, but my fear is those imports will just pop up from somewhere else. Thank you. Um, what are the likely scenarios for progress on the negotiations with China on trade, IP protection, subsidies for state-owned enterprises, and market access barriers? So, so I think it's, it's a really tough problem. I think Ross alluded to this, that in a sense, the tariffs is a very short run, sort of much easier to solve issue and the long run sort of intellectual property, um, state owned enterprises, um, you know, those are really, really hard nuts to crack. Um, and, you know, I really don't want to venture a guess. Like I said, I've just been completely surprised for the last year about what happens. So <laughs> I'm not gonna guess. Well, that's just Donald Trump being Donald Trump. He wants to surprise everybody at all times. 
I think that the president really needs a win early this year. And <laughs> my sense, my sense is that whatever's initiated will be the greatest, most incredible deal ever. And we will then declare not necessarily victory, but at least postpone an escalation. I'm, I'm hopeful that we won't see additional tariffs put on the other 250 billion, but President Trump is going to need something. Wow. He's going to need something to be able to point to to declare victory, but you know, it doesn't take much for him to declare victory. What specifically is the state of Utah doing that Arkansas is not? Boy, it's almost like I planted that question. Uh, I have a good guess as to where the question came from. But the answer is what they did uh, in 2000, 2001. Uh, Governor Levitt at that time, um, he, I remember this, he actually came to the Milken Institute Global Conference and a similar panel like this, afterwards he came up and he said, Ross, you know, I have some ideas on things we can do to improve the state. What do you think about them? So I've had a series of discussions with him and other leaders in Utah, but Utah made it a concerted decision to invest in STEM workforce. Uh, the state agreed to increase funding for engineering at both Utah University and BYU especially. And initially the goal was to double the number of engineers in 10 years. They've actually tripled it. And you go back and you look at Utah's progression, it largely stems from that investment in STEM at a very early age, combined with making, co-investing public funds with angel investors uh, and other venture capitalists, uh, creating accelerators and incubators, and that, that range from Ogden, Salt Lake, Provo has done a great job. They've also been focused on increasing research, but principally focused on commercialization and tech transfer. Uh, when I was at the Milken Institute, I created an index of uh, best universities for technology transfer. Utah University was number one. BYU was number four in the country. Now, you do have to be careful about that because it looks at outcome measures like licensing income, startup companies. It doesn't give you a measure of like market caps of firms that have been created like you would see in Silicon Valley or the number of employment. Uh, but it shows that they really have making, they've been making those investments. And perhaps most importantly, it has been sustained. It did not change when people left the governor's mansion, both Republicans and Democrats in some cases have been in there. That is something that's absolutely essential is the commitment to doing so has to be institutionalized so that it doesn't just reside with the current governor, but everybody's on board. So Utah, more than any other state in this country in the past 20 years, has made these investments. They recognize them as investments, not expenditures, and it has made a huge difference. Uh, Utah led the country last year in technology job growth, almost 7%. I mean, think about that and the spillover effect. So Utah has been one of the leaders overall. Thank you. How has the outlook for the world economy evolved over the last year? In other words, have forecasters been surprised on the upside or on the downside by incoming data and news? Um, that's a really interesting question. So, and I'll, I'll take a, a step back into 2017. Um, and essentially, you can look sort of month by month during 2017 what was happening to the outlook for 2017 for 2018. And throughout that time, data was surprising on the upside. So, what that means is month by month, the forecast for global growth was going up. Essentially, you know, the data was all coming in very, very strong. However, when we start looking at 2018, sort of you know, February-ish, um, that outlook both for 2018 and for 2019 has been getting marked down. So essentially what that says is incoming data, incoming news has surprised on the downside, um, which is one of the reasons why when we think about what 
the world economy looks like in 2019. A lot of forecasters are expecting it to be slower than 2018. Thank you. Dean Waller. On behalf of the University of Arkansas, I want to thank the panelists and Steve for participating in the Business Forecast 2019. <laughs> Steve, Carolyn, and Ross, as a token of our appreciation, a $500 scholarship will be presented to a Walton College student in your name to help defray costs of study abroad. Please come to the podium. Before we adjourn, let me remind you to fill out the evaluations in your packets as well as your 2019 forecast. You may leave both forms on your table for collection. Thank you for coming. We thank you for your support over the past 25 years, and we look forward to seeing you at our 26th forecast in 2020. We hope this information helps you succeed in 2019. Thank you.